Hey everyone, welcome back to this interview series. I'm delighted to have with us Kwok Le, who is a researcher at Google Brain. Um, he, I had the pleasure of working with him at Stanford University many years ago, and uh, Kwok and I were chatting just now. Fun fact, Kwok was the very first intern I had recruited into Google Brain when I was leading it uh, back in the early days. Ji Chen Yam was the second intern I ever recruited into Google Brain. And I think Jeff Hinton was the third intern I ever recruited. So I think Kwok uh, you know, was, was in good company. Since then, Kwok has done some of the most influential work in NLP, and I'm delighted to have him here today to tell us about some of his experiences. Good to, thanks for joining us, Kwok. Yeah, thank you, Andrew, for having me uh, in the interview series. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, talking to you. So today, Kwok, you are known widely as one of the most influential NLP and deep learning researchers, and your journey has been a complicated one. I think you had started off going to school in Vietnam and then went to Australia uh, and then Germany and then now the United States. So tell, tell, tell us more about your, 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 your journey getting into AI. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, so uh, when I was... Um uh, like a, a high school student, I was uh, fascinated by AI and I ended up reading a lot of books and even programmed some simple, um, you know, AI programs. And uh, then I got a scholarship uh, from uh, Australia uh, for my undergrad uh, in the Australian, uh, Australian National University. And in my second year of my undergrad, uh, I got a little bit bored and I said, you know, maybe I should do something uh, research uh, in, in AI because uh, it seems like the faculty there, they have some very uh, amazing faculty. So I contacted um, uh, Alex Mola, uh, who uh, actually took me as an intern for a summer. Um, and I work on uh, kernel methods uh, with him. And uh, that's the, I think that's, uh, even though I did, uh, some AI, you know, projects. And in, before that, that's the first time that I actually learned about machine learning. And I became super fascinated about machine learning. I, and I realized the potential of doing machine learning in, learning for AI. Wait, just, uh, th this is, wait, wait, backing up a bit. Um, I don't think I knew this story. What was the AI project you were coding up in high school that got your scholarship to, to Australian National uh, I, I didn't got, get a scholarship. Uh, to Australia because of the AI program, but I programmed it myself to learn more about AI and so on. I was building like a chatbot, you know, like a rule-based system to actually talk to myself, oh. right? And, you know, um, try to randomize the answer and so on, try to see how I can fool my friends uh, because I read about the Turing test and so on, and I, I was fascinated about it. Um, but I didn't win the scholarship because of that program. It was too simple for it. But I, you know, I, I because when I program it, I know how hard it is to write a computer program to do to to uh, actually be intelligent. Uh, so and I think and I think it's really cool that you started out that way because I think if there's someone listening to this interview series now that is coding up, you know, some slightly broken chatbot that kind of works, doesn't work, and finds it hard, right? They may be taking their first steps to an illustrious career in AI, much like you were once coding up like a, you know, so-so chatbot. Yeah. So I find it inspiring yeah. that, that we all start from, you know, programs that don't quite work as well as we wish, but that can be a wonderful yeah. start to... Yeah, yeah. You know, oh, actually, um, uh, much later, like many years, many, uh, many years later, I actually uh, had a conversation with you and turns out you, you also did something like this as well uh, in, uh, uh, in the past, but uh, I, I, I was fascinated. I was always fascinated about, you know, if you ever build an AI program, can I talk to it, right? Like, can I can I like talk to the program and hear about what it thinks? Um, but anyway, the uh, in terms of going back to the journey, uh, I did my uh, pro summer project with uh, um, with um, Alex Mola uh, on kernel methods, machine learning, and I realized the potential of using machine learning to build AI, and then. Um, and then after that, I graduated from, uh, you know, I, I kept on doing research with him for a while. And then after I graduated, he has a friend in Germany and I, I went to German, you know, Bernard Schoenkopf hosted me in Germany. 
And when I was in Germany, I was uh, also doing uh, uh, machine learning research. And near the machine learning research, there's like a neuroscience center that they were trying to think about, uh, trying to understand the brain and so on. So I became very fascinated about that as well. And then I uh, listened to one of your talks at NeurIPS that, that, that year that you were uh, talking about using machine learning for AI. And I, uh, by the way, that at that point in time, most people think about machine learning as pattern recognition, just doing machine learning for machine learning, like trying to classify things. But when I heard about machine learning to do AI, it really resonated with me. Um, so I, I applied to the Stanford PhD program to, uh, um, to, uh, to do um, the PhD. And then, uh, I, you know, I ended up uh, uh, going to Stanford and then uh, doing the PhD program, uh, the uh, PhD uh, degree with you. Uh, so that's uh, around 2007. And then uh, around 2010, 2011, you, uh, you told me that you were, found, uh, you were founding and creating a project at Google to scale up. Uh, deep learning research and make um, deep learning, uh, you know, like a hundred or a thousand times bigger. When I heard about it, I say, oh, that must be the future. Because of the neural nets I trained, like no matter, no matter what I did, the only thing that make a big difference is giving it more data and more compute. So it really resonated with me. Well, I'm, I'm, um, glad you thought, I'm glad you thought it was the future. A lot of my friends at the time were telling me it was a terrible idea to do this, to do this crazy Google brain thing. So I'm sorry, glad you thought it was reasonable. But actually, I, I, think, I, think, I think you and I, we had the privilege at Stanford of seeing some of the um, early results that Adam Coates was generating. And Adam Coates had shown yeah, using small scale resources and scaling up the neural networks really worked. So I think it made it easier. I, I, yeah. I totally agree that figure that Adam Coates did. I think, I mean, that's basically changing a lot of the things that I did. But I think probably a lot of the things in the field did too, but really influenced me uh, into, you know, uh, joining the project. Of course, uh, I, um, and then I went to uh, Google Brain and I think you, uh, and I was an intern. And like you said, I was the first intern of the, uh, the project. And uh, I, uh, I st uh, that's around 2011, around 2000, I think I remember that around April 2011. And then I stayed since um, with the project and, you know, brain has grown, grown from, you know, two, four or five people that you uh, um, had at the beginning and now to, uh, you know, much larger teams. And, uh, and now I do research, uh, still continue to do research in deep learning and AI. And uh, yeah. 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 Um, Google Brain was incredibly lucky to have you join. Uh, and I think one of the first home runs um, was that, you know, Google Cat project, which you were the lead engineer and the lead author on. You remember that? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I remember that. Uh, uh, so um, back when we were at Stanford, uh, I was, uh, you know, playing around with this uh, method called um, autoencoder, basically given the input image in and trying to reconstruct the image. And then if you apply some kind of sparsity, you start having some, at the low level of the neural network, you start seeing some kind of like uh, ash filters. And uh, uh, ash, fil uh, ash filter is usually very useful for, uh, for computer vision. And then there's uh, this influential result by uh, Hong Lak Lee, uh, which is um, our lab mate. And I think in the project, he, will, he did with you. Uh, is that like if you do if you do this in in a deeper neural network, you start having more sophisticated features. Um, and for me, at that point in time, you know, learning feature representation is very very in, very interesting. And the, our thought exercise, this is our, it's not me, but our thought exercise. But uh, you know, you got a lot of credit in this, so I have to say it. But our thought exercise were actually, can you make this, you know, a hundred or thousand times bigger? And learn even more sophisticated features. Um, we don't know what they're gonna end up uh, doing, like these networks, right? Uh, and then we set out doing this project. We scale, we scale it up um, from a single machine to sixteen thousand machines. Uh, I remember that, and uh, uh, we trained it on YouTube because I feel like I, my 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 question was, you know, what is the biggest Im uh, image dataset that we have access 
in the world at that moment. And it turns out that uh, YouTube images. So we trained the neural network for like a, a week or so. There's fast autoencoder. And, um, you know, with a lot of poking, we found some uh, hidden, uh, hidden, some neuron in the network that is very sensitive uh, to faces and cats. The, the typical things that we, that people expect on the internet. And, uh, um, yeah, and uh, the, one of the most uh, intriguing result was that it's actually faced, surprisingly, facing, uh, it, it, the network found cats on the internet. Uh, so <laughs> and I, I, I still remember, I think we're, we're both in the office that day. Uh, the team was so much smaller and you grabbed yeah. me and said, hey, Andrew, come to my computer and take a look. And I walked around and said, well, yeah. and that was the, the cat thing yeah. that, that you had discovered yeah. from a supervisor. Yeah, yeah. So and and I think you know and I I think one one piece of early deep learning history is I think almost all of us um, maybe overestimated the short term impact of unsupervised learning and didn't realize that supervised learning will be where a lot of the action you know at least in the early days would be. Um, <clears throat> although I find it interesting that one place where unsupervised learning has really taken off and is showing wonderful commercial results is in NLP. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sure, sure. And in fact, I still remember uh, when, you know, there was one day uh, in the office where we were in Google Brain, uh, where you yeah. walked over, I tapped on the shoulder and you said, hey, Andrew, come to the computer and take a look. And I walked over and there, you know, you gotten this cat to appear on your monitor from on you know, supervised yeah. learning. And I think that iconic, slightly blurry Google cat wound up being one of the um, you know, iconic images of unsupervised learning for that time. Yeah. So I think mm -hmm. team team couldn't have done that without without you. Yeah, okay. Okay. Shortly after, one of the other huge hits that uh, you worked on was the sequence to sequence model. And I think that that was another piece of work that changed the trajectory of NLP. Uh, do you tell us a bit more about that? The first version of uh, sequence to sequence is actually, a lot of people did not know, but there's this uh, idea called word to word, is translating word from one language to another. So, uh, and the reason why we did this is a fallen. So back in around 2012, 2013, suddenly there's this um, a wave of new uh, world vector methods and uh, pioneered by uh, a guy called uh, Thomas Mikulov and he was developing world to vec right and it trained it trains you know world vectors very quickly and uh, and it shows this amazing ability of uh, you know if you take uh, you know king uh, minus queen then the vector is uh, similar to man minus woman for example right and basically solving analogy. So the, the next question we ask is that, can we, is there any similar structure between the two languages? So for example, can you train world vectors from uh, in, uh, in Spanish and then also train world vectors uh, in uh, English? And can you try to align them a little bit? For example, can you learn that, you know, certain words in one language align with another word? And, uh, we did this thing and it turns out it works. So you can only have, let's say five words or, or you know, a hundred words in popular words in English. And you know the corresponding translation in Spanish and then you learn the rotation matrix. And then you can actually map. Now you can start translating words from one language to the other without uh, knowing too much about the language. So that, you know, this word to word translation gave me the feeling that, oh, maybe we should not do this word to word. Maybe we should do sentence to sentence. And, uh, and then we say, okay, so how do we do sentence to sentence? And it turns out that that's, uh, it, it wasn't easy to conceptually at the beginning for us. So we were thinking always, uh, all the ways, for example, let's try to um, read in the input sequence the input sentence, and then try to predict, uh, you know, what's the first word looks like, and then trying to predict what's the second word look like without knowing the first word. For example, it's like predicting the first word, second word, third word, etc., without knowing their relation. And then I said that, oh, maybe that's a little bit limited because if you predict the second word, you should know the first word because if 
you and if you predict the third word, you should know the second word, etc. Right. So it has to be some some sort of dependency. So we uh, we thought about it in, in an in, in English sentence. It you know doesn't really make sense to independently predict the first and the second and the third and the fourth words. You yeah. should predict yeah. the first word and then based on that figure out what's, what's the second word and then based on that yeah. only after that figure out what the third word. Yeah, yeah. And the sentences you output just make a lot more sense when you do it one word at a time rather than try to spew out all ten words at the same time that may not end up yeah. relating to each other. Yes, yes, that, that's a good way to explain it. Uh, now, it turns out that um, uh, so after this, uh, you know, like from the point that we realized this idea to actually making it work, it took like a year, and it was actually uh, very difficult. And uh, one one uh, bottleneck about this whole thing is actually training the sequence model to do this. And back at the time when I was training this, I trained with a conventional uh, recurrent neural network. But uh, at that uh, point in time, uh, together with me, Ilya Suchkova and Oreo Vinyal, they all also have very similar ideas of doing this. So, and Oreo Vinyal and uh, Ilya Suchkova, they had, uh, they know uh, how to train this model, how to get this model to work with uh, LSTM. So we met and then we decided that let's let's try with the LSTM. It turns out it gave, it gave us really good improvements. But uh, um, when the first translation, it still look awful. And uh, it can output certain words that look like the input, but mostly wrong. So the question is, can we, should we continue? And, uh, um, and um, you know, I was into, you know, trying all sort of ideas and so on, but credit to Ilya that he said, maybe we should train, uh, train this model better. We should really train this model better and train a bigger model train bigger model and train it longer, train it better. And uh, um, uh, credit to him that actually actually that approach actually turns out to be uh, successful. And then he, we train it, we lower the perplexity slowly, slowly over time. And then we start, when after, uh, you, know, uh, you know, a couple of months, we, re we start seeing um, better and better translation you know now it's just only one or two words but like five words certainly more correct and we realized we realized that we were onto something so so it sounds like if i got the history right you tried the environments then got better results with lstms and then the last mile was just scaling more data bigger network bigger lstm network and that wound up being the last yeah. several steps to get to that you know seminal breakthrough that that, that we then saw in the yeah. years yeah, I would say that like last seems trivial uh, from the perspective of a researcher, but like I think it makes a huge difference for the project because you know had I tried you know fancy ideas and you know you know also like uh, crazy ideas, I think I would not get the thing to work and we would delay the project for much longer, and uh, it's it's a lot of lesson, even though the last mile. Uh, seems to uh, to be trivial from the research point of view. It made a huge difference for the project. And had we uh, invest and in, had we invested in you know fancy ideas and not didn't try scale and didn't try to train the model longer or better, you know if we invest on more on ideas, we never got the model to work and uh, it would not it would delay the project uh, for much longer. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't seem trivial to me at all. And, and I find that when I'm building systems, when I'm you know, in basic research mode, sometimes I hold the data set fixed and change the algorithm. But when I'm in production, just build a commercial system that works mode, sometimes I hold the algorithm fix, you know, pick an architecture that I think is good enough and then spend all yeah. my time changing the data. So there's very, very different ways of operating. Yes, yes, yes. So the work that you did with uh, Ilya and Oreo on sequence sequence models, right? This is a seminal piece of work, really huge impact on, on the whole field of deep learning. And then almost coming full circle, um, you built chatbots in high school, and building on the ideas of sequence to sequence, you also built this well much more advanced chatbot than your high school version, I imagine, called Mina. And I remember right. reading that paper and thinking, wow, some of these outputs actually look you know pretty cool. Do you, do you talk a bit about the Mina chatbot 
project? Sure, sure. Um, one of my dreams in, in my high school is that the viewer, Jack Walker, uh, can tell you a joke. You know, it can, it can tell me uh, like a new original joke. And, um, you know, one of the things when we're writing the batch uh, every Tuesday, because we sound on Wednesday, is uh, yeah. uh, my editor-in-chief and I often end up sitting around brainstorming for five minutes to see what's the joke we want to tell one of the other people. <laughs> so if you're a chatbot yeah. to automate joke telling, it'll make my life easier. So. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Uh, same with me. You know, I, I sometimes I want to give a talk, and I always, always begin the talk with like, some joke, and I find it sometimes it's hard to make the joke as well. Yeah. But... Uh, yeah, but like when I was uh, in high school, I was thinking, you know, can we come up with a way to create like a, an original joke? And it turns out if you think about through that exercise, it's actually difficult, more difficult than um, than you can we can program. Uh, so, uh, so um, sort of after we work, I worked on the sequence to sequence project. I um, realized that if you can uh, get in sequence at, in, as input. And then uh, produce sequences output. Maybe one of the biggest application is to train a model can talk to you. Uh, now, I actually this idea actually uh, uh, actually executed better. Uh, actually, uh, the who, who thought about this idea at Google first is not me. It's actually Oreo Vigna. So he actually trained a chatbot that actually worked really well, and we we realized that maybe we should collaborate and then build like a chatbot, cool chatbot. And uh, we did it in around 2016 or something like that. And it's, it's like a paper on archive. And we show that there's some potential of this. Yeah. Remember, you do a lot of work, right, within Google to get permissions to use the um, IT support, the support exactly. data in order yeah. to get into the chatbot. Yeah, yeah. So back at the time, we were like, we were researchers, we, we asked ourselves, where's the data set? So one thing what we did was uh, like going after the, uh, you know, technical support internally at Google and get a data set from them and then train a model. And then it, uh, we asked a question like, can you debug uh, this? Uh, I, I lost my password. What should I do? And then it start answering some some kind of question. Although, you know, um, although it still feels a little bit off, but you start seeing it's, there's, there's something there, right? There's something there that's really promising. Uh, and then I spent... I, I, I just have this very clear recollection. Uh, you, me, yeah. I think Adam Coates, a bunch of us were having dinner in a restaurant in Palo Alto, and you had just gotten permission to use the data, and you were very excited over dinner that day. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So, I, I, I remember recollection of that dinner. <laughs> Yes, yes. Uh, that was when we had a, a sushi in, uh, in, in the Palo Alto restaurant. <laughs> Good times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I remember uh, we, we talked about that and uh, how, uh, how uh, excited you were that, you know, someone worked on chat, uh, chatbots because you also worked on chatbot back in the days. Um, but, um, yeah, uh, and then uh, I spent one year... Okay. And I think I told you about my high school chatbot attempt, which was actually more of a prank, right? I think I told you, I, I, I wrote a you know, prank chatbot where um, I will type, and no matter what I type, the chatbot will print out what is your name. So I would type, you know, Q-U-O-C space L-E, and as I type that, the chatbot will print out W-H-A-T space is your name. And the effect <laughs> was when I hit enter, then it will print out what I actually type. So to the user, they see, they think I typed what is your name, and then it prints Quark Lur. And so, so to my friends, I was pranking. It looked magical because I could ask her the question, they would know the answer. But what was actually happening was I was typing the answer. It just was displaying a pre canned question. So, so that's, <laughs> that's impressive. No AI, just a, just a high school kid <laughs> prank. Let's see, go, go. I, I, your, your, your mina was much more, much more interesting. So tell, tell, tell us that story. Yeah. So I, I, I spent one year like trying to uh, improve the bot. Uh, myself and uh, I, I I didn't get very far mm. and uh, turns out the bot is very hard to uh, imp uh, how to improve right? it after you actually mm, after so if you train multi turn conversation and after one or two turns uh, it becomes very difficult uh, actually uh, the, the, for example it can uh, answer you the first turn but the second turn it starts to forget information it it doesn't give you you know, good answer and so on. So it's pretty much broken. Um, um, but then, 
by the end of uh, 2016 and 2017, I met this guy at Google. He's an uh, engineer at Google. Uh, his name is Daniel. And um, came and told me and said, I, I want to, I also had a dream to be a chatbot. So let's work together to be a chatbot. And, uh, and uh, when he came in, back at that moment, something magical happened, which is basically people have discovered, has developed this uh, transformer architecture. And we say, okay, maybe the transformer is more promising because it can uh, understand long range dependency better, right? So it can see multiple turn better than the LSTM. And so we started uh, working on using the transformer as to deal with this multi-turn conversation. And, you know, we train bigger model again, right? Longer and using more resources at Google. And uh, uh, slowly we start to see some improvement. And uh, one, mo one magical moment that, uh, in my opinion, is that I look through the log. So we uh, allow some people to chat to it um, at Google. Right? And there, there was one magical moment is that we looked through the log and then I saw some joke the bot made. And, we, uh, and, the, uh, uh, and it's actually in the paper about, you know, the joke was about, you know, uh, if cow go, cows go to Harvard, then horses should go to Hayward. <laughs> it's a fun, it's a dad joke, all right? Uh, a dad joke. Uh, and then, uh, but but it's actually a multi-tone conversation. It, it, it's trying to lead the audience into it. So I saw it and I thought, oh, um, so I tried to look into the training data to see whether it's actually, it, does it have anything uh, like Hayward or, you know, uh, cows uh, go to Hayward, uh, sorry, horses go to Hayward or not. And we couldn't find it, so uh, it, so it's truly is actually trying to invent. It understand the concept of jokes, it understand the concept of puns, and it, it actually created a new uh, joke. Uh, uh, and I think that's that's a very magical moment in my opinion. And uh, um, yeah, pretty excited about it. I think. Yeah, I, I I remember reading that joke when I read the Mina paper. Hey, yeah. how 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 do you know if it was um, uh, true understanding the concept of jokes and puns and Harvard versus Harvard, uh, versus yeah. you know if you if you right, in, in, enough monkeys on a typewriter right, or enough randomness means eventually there'll be a funny joke. Yeah, so we look into the training data very carefully and see look for the word Harvard, right? and see whether that word mentioned anywhere. It mentioned once in the entire training corpus, but it is not uh, next to like a joke. It's mentioned in a different con uh, context. Our conclusion is, is actually trying to uh, actually understand this concept of a joke because the training data set has a lot of jokes. Uh, training data set has, has a, lot, a lot of jokes as well. Um, uh, puns, there's a lot of puns, but this, this, that particular example is actually novel we could not find anywhere in the, in the training data cool. so you know, you've been at the forefront of you know uh, nlp research for many years uh, um, and then we we continue to see breakthroughs in nlp on a regular basis so i'm curious yeah. looking into the future what are you most excited about in terms of things yet to come in nlp Oh yeah, I think um, I think I'm most uh, in NLP. I'm most uh, mostly excited about uh, uh, generative models. I think um, uh, currently a lot of NLP and uh, is basically doing you know traditional NLP where you can classify the sentiments of the sentence, or you can do um, uh, name entity recognition on the sentence. But I'm more excited about the capability of generate uh, generation. Like, can you generate? A new book that um, you know are consumed by humans and you know teach people a new concept. Um, can we can we get to that point, or can or, or maybe it, can it help like uh, a, a director to uh, a screenplay uh, writer to come up with a better uh, movie plot? Yeah. Right, there's there's so much potential in using these technology for generation, in my opinion. Um, now, a huge, uh, since, since the right, breakthroughs of transformer model and the several flavors of transformers, one huge vector of progress for the generative models has been scale, right? Scale of uh, data yeah. and especially compute. 
Um, other than scale, what what are the what do you think are the important vectors of progress for generative models? Um, okay, I think um, uh, I think the the um, I think true understanding. I think uh, right right now we look into like for example text that generates. It still things are a little bit off. Like uh, it made up stuff. Right, like uh, there, there's some some facts that it made up. So the question is, can we get the bot to really have common sense understanding and uh, um, and generating more factually correct uh, output? Uh, I think that would be a big thing. Um, I think that would be a big factor of, pro of progress. You know, yeah, I want to dig a little bit in further into that because I think a lot of researchers, uh, including me, you know, sometimes have talked about computers understanding images or understanding language. And, and yeah. common sense um, is a concept that philosophers have debated for, I think, over 2,000 years now. Yeah. So when, we, when you talk about NLP understanding or common sense, um, yeah. are these scientific concepts that are measurable? Or are these philosophical concepts that you kind of feel like it understands it? But how do you approach these questions oh, yeah, of understanding yeah. and common okay. sense? I think it's measurable. So in some sense, uh, you can ask, for example, you can uh, um, for example, you can create, for example, GPT or any language model. You can give a prompt about, let's say, you know, talking about the GDP in the world, right? Like, let's talk about GDP in the world. And can you look at the GDP and you compare with Wikipedia and can you say they're, they're matching? And uh, that's that's measurable. Or you can start talking about movies in 2020, right? And uh, can it can it uh, understand that these are the movies, right? Uh, uh, I I think it is measurable. Um, do you, do you have a favorite yeah. set of benchmarks? Like the, there's like a common sense QA is one data set. Do you have a favorite benchmark for measuring understanding or common sense? I thought common sense is a too. is a bold name, you know, to say this is our yeah. measure of common sense. It's a bold name yeah. for data. Maybe sense. we can uh, instead of like talk uh, uh, talking about common sense, we can just talk about maybe factuality a little bit, uh, just factual knowledge, right? Just just generate some statements that are actually factually uh, correct, right? Uh, for example, uh, you know, how always is Barack Obama and so on. It can generate correctly, and um, from that perspective, I think it's easy to create a data set for that. We we haven't had that data set yet, but I think it will be created. Um, I think that people people are in uh, 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 other AI that created like common sense um, that to, data sets to measure uh, the performance of uh, uh, generative models, right? So um, I don't I, I I I'm not expert in this field, but I think my my feeling is that when I read a lot of these outputs. I still see things that are actually factually not correct. And I think see things a little bit off. And I think like addressing that issue can, can be uh, quite uh, um, important, yeah. Cool. So like a test set on measuring factual correctness would be a good way to help yeah. the view move forward. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. yeah. In your time at Google, you've mentored a lot of younger engineers. And even at your time at Stanford, um, you mentored a lot of younger students. So today, there are a lot of people wanting to uh, break into AI or they want to advance or to grow their career in AI. What advice do you have to someone wanting to build their career in AI? Yeah. Okay. So first of all, I, I have to say that I, I don't have true meta advice. I don't, I don't like the concept of meta advice for a lot of people because I think, you know, food for me is poison for other people. Uh, we are living in different world now. But I say... Um, you know, looking through my journey, I say that I started out from something very, very uh, different, right? I came from a different culture, different uh, background. So maybe one piece of advice is that, you know, like career as a whole is taking a long time to make really significant progress. I never can imagine that I make a big progress. I, I make a, a good contribution for translation, for example. So... Um, so uh, my th my thinking is that um, you, maybe you can start quite low, but maybe you know with uh, hard work and dedication, can you you know over time you can you know uh, do good work and uh, make impact for the field. And so be patient, really, right? Yeah. Um, so for me, that that journey has taken me. Uh, 
uh, 15, 15 years uh, also already uh, from the point that I started uh, and then un until that, you know, I become a more senior researcher uh, and at Google. So be patient and because it, it takes time to do impactful work. Um, that's uh, number one. Um, and number two is that I think naivety can be good. Uh, a lot of people think that they have to read a lot and understand everything. Uh, I think naivety sometimes can be in your favor. For example, uh, in around uh, 2014, when I was doing this uh, sequence to sequence, uh, 2013, I tried to re-implement um, uh, phrase-based and neural machine translation. And I was just a bad programmer. I didn't know anything about phrase-based neural machine translation. I was bad. I, was, I, I spent two months implementing it. I couldn't do it. And because of that, because of that frustration, um, I, I say, okay, maybe I should do something here. I should, I should do end-to-end -end learning instead. But imagine if I was a good programmer and I knew a lot about phrase-based machine translation, I would program it successfully. And then I would not develop uh, uh, a sequence to sequence. Uh, and I, I would not participate in a different project like that. So maybe naivety is also can be good. Um, uh, yeah. I think, I think what you said about patience um, is, is great advice. And sometimes it does take some time, years, uh, to become really good at AI. And, and it can be a long journey, but it's extremely rewarding journey. So I'm curious, what advice do you have for someone that is learning about AI, learning about machine learning, growing their career? And you know, in the course of that process, how can someone know if they're making progress? And how can someone know if they're doing the right things to be advancing at the right speed? Right, like we need to identify a data set, identify a task where you can see progress uh, more quickly. Um, and maybe sometimes you you don't um, you don't get success on that. Then try to understand why and try to talk to you know more maybe contact more senior researchers and try to figure out um, all the uh, senior engineers and try to figure out what went wrong. Um, I mean, if if I were to start uh, AI today as a, in career in AI as a researcher, let's say, then I would probably maybe the start the starting point would be I would try to. You know, replicate, replicate some uh, AI, AI my, my favorite AI research papers, right? Then try trying to find, you know, look for, read the paper, trying to understand it, reproduce the result, compare against their GitHub, and trying to, you know, to get into the habit that I can implement quickly and, uh, you know, my code can reproduce the result quickly. And, um, um, and then, you know, if, if I make progress in that easy phase, then I can start thinking about how could I contribute? How could I uh, get better at developing my own ideas? Uh, so that, that would I do. do. And then uh, I, I would start, by, in other words, I, I would start with something easier first. Try, some, try to get something that easier. Like uh, it's like... Um, uh, it's like learning to swim. You don't want to go to the ocean to learn to swim. You want to learn to swim uh, in a pool first and then, you know, do something quite easy that you get happy doing it and then move slowly, move yourself towards more and more difficult tasks. And uh, to the, for example, creating your new idea, writing your own paper, that's difficult. But I think that reproducing uh, like an existing paper and getting a result on MNIST or CIFA, that uh, seems easy enough to do. So maybe start with that first. Start, start with something simple, yeah. Good advice. Kind of like, you know, we use yeah. curriculum learning in, in training neural networks yeah. as well. Thanks, Paul. This has been great. Um, before we wrap up, do you have any final words or any final thoughts for the, for the uh, viewers watching this? Oh, I can say some of my final words. Uh, I say, you know, I... I I accept the interview because I want to see Andrew and uh, I want to thank, uh, you know, Andrew was a spectacular educator, um, I have to say. So I remember in 2017, I came to, you know, I, I was already a researcher. I wrote papers and so on. I, I came to Stanford. I started my PhD. I came to a lecture hall by you, the CS229 lecture. And I literally had goosebumps because your lecture was so good. Um, it, it was so, it was like another level. And um, I learned, I learned a lot. I think uh, I learned a lot from, from your class and 
you know, from your original thinking as well. But thank you for your contribution in educating uh, in, in the community uh, about deep learning. I think that's that's going to be uh, very very impactful for the field as well because we need more uh, you know more people to to, uh, to move the field forward as well. No, yeah, thanks, thanks, Hua. Well, wasn't expecting yeah. to say that. It's very 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 kind of you. It means means a lot. Yeah, well, thank you. And I think th thanks thanks for being with me on this interview series. It's wonderful to see all the tremendous contributions you're making to, to NLP and deep learning. It's been great chatting as always. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> for more interviews with NLP thought leaders, check out the deeplearning.ai YouTube channel or enroll in the NLP specialization on Coursera.